everyone. And welcome back to the Doctor. We'll see you now. Thank you for joining us uh, and thank you for the likes and subscribes uh, that are being, uh, being put here for the Newcastle Noir YouTube channel. If you are a frequent viewer, you know that for the Doctor, the discovery of a new author or an author new to the Doctor is a cause for great celebration. So I hope you will join me in the excitement that it is because uh, thanks to this author's agent, I have found a series that I should have been into a long time ago. Uh, if you are familiar with the series, I'm sure you'll be saying, well, duh, of course, you should have been there. And if you're new like me to the series, I wish you hours and hours of extremely dark but pleasurable reading. So it gives me great honour and pleasure to welcome Simon, Simon McLeave, in for consultation. Hello, oh. Simon. Welcome. How are you? Oh, I'm very well. Looking forward to this. It's very exciting. It is so wonderful um, to be able to sit back and spend some time finding out about an author and finding out about their work. Um, I, you know, I, I know um, since the Doctor Will See You Now um, started on, on YouTube, we've been living through tricky times and those tricky times continue. So I think to be able just to, for a moment, not to forget, but for a moment, just to delve into some fabulous writing and find out what took you into that. The reason for our time together though, is to celebrate uh, the publication of book 11. I don't know if you have a copy there. Would you, would you have a copy to hold up? I do have one in, in two seconds. Here's one I made earlier. It's just, I have a proof copy and, and it's, ah, you see you, Look at that, how beautiful. How professional. How professional, <laughs> that is gorgeous. So we're here to talk about the Lake Vrinui Kellen, oh, yeah? Yes, that's yeah. right. Set in Snowdonia, I'm going to ask it at one point in our conversation if you'll take us to the locations uh, and talk to us about those and what they mean to you. Um, but before we do that, I always like to find out because if this is book 11, mm. and I read, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I read that uh, the first in the Snowdonia Killings yeah. um, was published in 2020. Is this book part of that series? Yes, yeah, so the book one, the Snowdonia Killings, came out uh, in January 2020. So there have been 11 books. Actually, there's, a, there's four prequels as well. So I've been busy. You have, haven't you? I would call you busy and prolific yes. and perhaps the envy of many an author who says, you know, it's just not happening. It evidently happens for you. But before we talk about how it happens, maybe your process um, and the stories that you've obviously had to, to tell, why crime fiction? What got you into this murky profession? Ah, that's a very good question. Um, I thought just stories, mystery stories. I suppose mm -hmm. when I was a kid, um, the first recollection of reading books and being absolutely enthralled with books were the Enid Blyton Secret Seven, smashed through the whole lot, then the famous five. And, mm -hmm. and from then on, I think just I was just hooked on um, you know, mystery stories, solving mm -hmm. a mystery. Mm -hmm. um, and then I graduated to the sort of Ian Fleming and uh, Alistair MacLean and and then obviously as I got older I kind of got into proper crime books but right from the beginning it was always um, I'm slightly obsessed really um, so I kind of also anything I've ever about crime stories so everything I've ever kind of watched whether it's a you know a tv series mm -hmm. or a film or anything I've ever read always seems to be dark crime I don't know it's it's probably the way my brain's wired but um oh. it's, a, it's just a fascination and it's just the one thing I I sort of I try other things and then I sort of sit there going well it's not really you know nothing like a good murder <laughs> indeed I think what you say though that, that that sense of 
where does the writing naturally take you? You know, it, it's, you know, you try other things, but really, you know, where I am happiest is creating stories around murder and mayhem. I find it interesting to read in your biography, though, that, you know, writing is something that you have been involved with for, for a long time, but within film and TV, uh, in script development, script writing. And I wonder yeah, the yeah, I inf that. influences of that. I mean, when you, you know, now that you dedicate yourself full time to crime fiction writing, do you draw on, you know, techniques and strategies that you knew in a former professional life? Or do you approach your, your, your crime writing in a very different way? No, it's very similar. I think storytelling is storytelling. So uh -huh. I think, um, and I certainly think that the speed at which I write uh, was heavily influenced by, um, so I wrote on things like The Bill or Silent Witness and, mm. and other kind of stuff like that. And the turnaround time on those is very fast. And so is the rewriting time. Um, so you get you get a phone call and someone says, "Well, tomorrow morning I need those scenes rewritten," and it, you you can't. You've got to do it. You've yeah. Got to do it. Yeah, yeah. You can't say I'm <clears> waiting <throat> for the muse to inspire me. No, exactly. So you kind anyway. of you're going back, and sometimes it will be a change of cast, and it'll be like, "Well, that character doesn't, doesn't exist anymore. <clears throat> Can you go back and rewrite it?" And I suppose doing that uh, got me very very used to writing fast. Uh, writing scenes, going back, rewriting them, um, but also gave me a very kind of innate sense of structure, dialogue, mm -hmm. characters, plot. Um, and, and, and also I worked as a script editor and a script development person for a while back, back in the 90s. Um, and so I've worked with, you know, stories, stories uh, for television and film. Um, so I kind of spend, I spend a lot of my earlier life just working with writers or writing um, three act structures with characters that sort of develop over a period. So I kind of, when I sat down to write my first novel, I kind of had a good, very, very good sort of background in, in storytelling. Mm -hmm. uh, oh. I think that helped me, yeah. Yeah, definitely, definitely. But, but just, you know, like con continuing with that idea a little bit, I wonder, um, are there things that you can do now because you are in control of the text um, and there, you know, there aren't necessarily those same pressures as it needs to be now and you're not working in conjunction with a group of other writers, which normally happens on yeah. TV series. Are there some aspects of this that now you really relish that oh. you didn't have back then? Absolutely. Uh, well, there's two, two things that sprung to mind there. First of all, is that I can come up with the story uh, with very, and because I'm, um, I have my own publishing company for the Snowdonia series, uh, I can write a story and, and with very, with almost virtually no interference, mm. um, which is, <laughs> which is when you've worked in the TV and film business is absolutely incredible to have that kind of control. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I suppose, and the other thing is, which, which I think we're talking about skills between script writing. A lot of script writing is what you don't, what you don't say. Mm -hmm. Sort of allow a scene to breathe. Uh, and I do love the idea that in a novel you can have the inner thoughts, the inner dialogue, the inner conflict of a character within a scene, rather than allowing uh, on a on a script the the audience to make that mind up for you you are able to kind of really kind of go into into great detail on that. So, um, yeah, I mean, yeah, I enjoy it more than writing scripts. Mm -hmm. I, I, I think that's wonderful though, to have, you know, to have worked one way in storytelling and now working maybe in, in, in a different way. Mm. And yet the passion still comes through that what is important for you, however it is, it is to tell those stories. So well, I wonder if we may, uh, if we can come to the book in hand mm -hmm. uh, and the fact that you have 11 books in this series and that you're still there writing, um, many an author will do a trilogy and say that's enough. Mm. I know other authors who say six, six books and I'm done. 
Yeah. And yet here you are at book 11. How do you stay fresh? It's making me think like a relationship that's been, you know, that's been there, you know, a marriage, a good marriage or something like that. What's the secret? Gosh, I don't know. I think it's um, I, somehow I created the two central characters. I love the two central characters and they are real in my head. Mm -hmm. um, they exist and they have such a, uh, they have their own lives. And it's like going back to old friends when I start to write for them again. Uh, and I kind of know them so well that I know every single reaction, every single, what, what they're thinking. Um, and I just love spending time with them. Mm -hmm. And, and, I get incredible feedback from my readers about who, when they start the new book, they all say, oh, it's like going back to old friends and it's such a, you know, it's so lovely to see her and what's happening with her relationships and her family and uh, the character, Nick, who's her sidekick. Mm. Uh, he's got a family and uh, a, a young child. So it's quite a kind of a, I think people are invested in it a lot in terms of their, those, those characters, mm. personal lives, and they're really flawed which I love. I kind of, <laughs> I love flawed characters because we're all... As we are as human bonds. beings. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I kind of like that. And I think um, if I believe what my re readers email me and tell me, then they love the fact that they're, they're flawed and, um, but they kind of have deep down have a decent heart. And, uh, and I just keep coming up with stories for them. And I suppose when I'm writing book, so I have book 12 on pre-order. So when I'm writing book 11, something starts to pop into my head as I write the second half of it. Yeah, as to where things might. Just, I just go, God, I'd be really good if we did that. Um, and often I will start with a twist. So when I, I think so far I've managed to, to find um, Peter James, you know the Peter James? Yes, thing? oh yeah. Now, I probably can't swear, but he talks about the um, F word moment in a book where you get towards the end and then you go, oh my God, I never saw that coming. Yeah, why didn't I, yeah, yeah. And for me, that is, that if I can get that to the point where people read it and then go, I never saw that, that's amazing, what a great twist. My job is done in terms of plot and narrative. Um, so I normally start with that what will be a great twist and then work backwards covering mm. my tracks as we go to the walls the so i know from the very time from the moment i start writing what the twist is so i kind of i can manipulate everything to that point where i know we've got to get there at some point in about seventy thousand words and i kind of i kind of play around with red herrings and other twists and turns um so i think it's just really fun it's what a great way to what a great way to earn a living. Yes, yes. I, I you know, I'm at times when I've, I've interviewed Anne Cleves and she said exactly that, you know, I, you know, I don't know where you write, but she writes at the kitchen table and she says, you know, what a privilege and what a pleasure to be able to say, mm. I am going to sit down and I am going to write and because I enjoy this. Yeah, it's not a job, is it? Yeah, nobody's, you know, it, it, there's something that comes from within that I have these stories to tell. Yeah. Um, and, and yeah. I, I, the, the, mm, and, and the other thing as well that, you know, from what you're saying and what I've noticed as well, you know, the idea that people do, um, people do get very uh, invested mm. in your work. You know, I, like I say, I'm really sorry that, I, that, that our paths have not crossed beforehand. Because again, seeing that, you know, you have this following, um, you know, and people are just keen to know what's next, what's going to happen to these characters next. And it's almost like, yes, yes, you might have a story, you know, you might, you might, there might be a crime and there might be whatever, but what's happening with these characters? Yes, those are, those are the two, those, the, the, those are the two major parts of each book. On one, you know, on one hand, I've got to write a decent narrative plot that twists and turns, picks mm -hmm. all the boxes, it's an investigation, hopefully with a great twist. Um, but we you know woven into that we want to know what's going on with our characters and you know how are they feeling and what's going on with their personal yeah. lives and what's come into that and normally i have to throw something into their personal lives to kind of give it something to write about so something that creates a sort of conflict or chaos mm -hmm. um but it was in yeah it's interesting what you were just saying because i um 
fairly recently, I went, to, I had did a Zoom book club with um, some lovely ladies that live out in California Ooh. who'd read my books. Yay! And um, I was absolutely amazed at, at how much detail they, A, had read the books in, but also the questions that they came up with in terms of the inner lives of the characters. Um, to the point where some of the stuff they asked me, I didn't know the answer to, but it was sort of, they'd really thought yeah. about those characters, where they'd been, what they'd done before, how they felt about this. Um, so yeah, in terms of that investment, it's, uh, it's humbling in some ways that someone, they think about a character in that way. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that, you know, again, the, the, the quality of characterization that people would want to, you know, I, I don't know about you, but there are times Sometimes reading, more often watching a series on TV and, and thinking, I just don't care. Mm. <laughs> you know, it's like, I, I, yeah. this is not, you know, I, time is finite and, yeah. you know, and I, I can't put it into this. So just thinking about, you know, the book club that you mentioned, that people people took time. Mm. Isn't that amazing? To go beyond. Well, amazing, but wonderful um yeah, and excellent. again you know going back to the stories that you tell but i have to ask you if mm -hmm. um i read um that your background isn't wales that it's elsewhere mm -hmm. so if that's the case you know why wales why snowdonia what was it that drew you I mean, you live there now, um, yeah. and your stories are set there. Why? You know, of, of all the places in all the world, <laughs> how did you happen to walk into to Snowdonia? Um, yeah, I'm a South Londoner in exile, but um, I suppose I'm, a, I'm from the city, and uh, my, my wife is from North Wales. So oh, we, uh -huh. and we had my daughter, well, she's 18 now, which is frightening. But um, when she was very little, we decided that South London wasn't the greatest place to bring up kids. Mm -hmm. We wanted to downsize. And her family were up from here. So we moved up here and I was a teacher for a while. And then when I got back into writing, or uh, various people said, why don't you start writing again? Um, I've been reading books and I've been watching TV series and thinking, no one's ever, no one's ever, I mean, I, th I think they probably have, but I wasn't aware that anyone had written a bit, a long series of detective novels set in Snowdonia. Mm. And because of the backdrop of it, it has so much history, so much legend, the myths, the folk tales. And then you have, you know, mountains and lakes and beaches and valleys, and it's just stunning. And I kind of thought, well, it's a gift in terms of, um, a backdrop to a to a, a detective series um but also so that so i've made R ruth hunter is my central character but she's from south london and she is looking for a quieter life as a detective mm -hmm. she's been working in peckham and she's burnt out and she decides that her she had a childhood holidays up in snowdonia mm -hmm. and she sort of has this idyllic view of what it will be like it'll be very quiet there'll be no crime <laughs> Um, there'll be that night like, someone will steal some sheep or something and she'll just sit sit in North Wales having a nice time and obviously that doesn't happen um, but I could write from her point of view of being a person from an inner, inner city London yeah. moving to North Wales and the kind of culture clash you know the sort of you know um, expectations of somebody mm -hmm. going yeah um, and and having those of having the expectations being sort of slightly arrogant, I suppose, maybe in some ways that us Londoners can be moving to somewhere small and um, and also just, but also then also finding out more and more about the place you live in, which is incredibly interesting. Mm. So, so Ruth was me. It was in, in, in that way about a sort of a person moving from a huge city to a very small sort of like little village in North Wales. And um, I could write exactly what that feels like, which was useful. Yes, yeah, def definitely, definitely. But uh, but I do like as well how that the use of the outsider allows for that greater exploration of place mm. and space that maybe somebody who was born there wouldn't, you know, things wouldn't be as striking, things wouldn't be as different. So, we, you know, why would 
you know, why would you comment on them? Uh, whereas Ruth, of course, not being from there originally, would comment on certain things or would find things unusual. Um, sure. Yeah. And also there's a hostility, um, a little bit of hostility in the first book, certainly in a bit in the second, um, because, you know, she's a, she's a detective inspector from the Met and she's moved up and they all think that she's going to, you know, sort of throw weight around and think that they're all kind of parochial and yeah. don't know what they're doing. Um, and so there's a kind of, there's a little bit, it's a good thing, there's a little bit of friction and a bit of conflict there. And, and then when her sidekick gets to know her, he realises that she's not like that. And when she gets to know him, she realises that, you know, um, and now, you know, 11 books later, they're, they're best of friends, they tell each other everything. But... Uh, it was a good way of starting off, at least for the mm. first few books, of them kind of getting to know each other. Um, Definitely, as I say, I'm really looking forward to going to going back, um, and actually because the, you know because the, the the characters as I have just met them in book eleven, um, you know, and and I've got you some questions about where they are at now in in that journey. But just to ask you, so from book one to book eleven, what's the time frame? Um, it's pretty much how I wrote them so I'm, I'm guessing about two and a half years okay okay so that's interesting as well isn't it you know that idea of it's not necessarily you know a crime a year that is happening but within those yeah two and a half years um and then it makes me think maybe next time I drive to my parents in South Wales, <laughs> I might bypass <laughs> that dodgy yeah. criminal area. Exactly. <laughs> Not a safe Very place dangerous. to be. Mm. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but again, I, it's something that I've noticed in more recent times and it thrills me, as, and, but it makes me think more of the TV series that we've had around, you know, Welsh crime drama um, and how the area you know just really does seem to lend itself to crime how atmospheric it is mm. um, and how I think for many of us you know we, we are not familiar with those dark um foreboding places I think very often we we you know if, if, if we're into our crime fiction in a big way we think of Scandinavia or Nordic Noir as being yeah. but you know yeah, that was exactly that was exactly my thought when I thought of Snowdonia. I've been uh, I've been reading a lot of Scandi Noir and watching it, uh, the kind of the original, um, you know, whether it's Norwegian or Danish, the the original version of the killing. Yes, and, just, yeah. and, I, and went. I've got this on my doorstep, but it's North Wales, but it's it's the perfect place. It's got misty, you know, fog covered mountains, you know, great big lakes. Uh, forests it's uh, it's the perfect place for that kind of uh remote landscape oh, and as you yeah. said foreboding ominous yeah ominous landscape yeah yeah definitely so a police procedural mm. set in 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 north wales how how did you get to know policing in in rural-ish wales Oh, uh, a lot of research. Um, there's a guy I know who's a detective sergeant at Wrexham CID. Uh, so on the first couple of books, he gave, he held my hand and I kind of, uh, and also I had a friend who was a, um, uh, a sergeant down in Dorset. So I just, I spoke to a lot of police. I spoke to, especially, especially those two. Yeah. Uh, I spoke to them and said, um, if this happens how does that work if this happens how does that work um and once I kind of got the hang of it actually um I was fairly spot on with quite a lot of it um so yeah I learned it I learned it by talking to them um and hopefully to try and get I think it's that thing is like you kind of want po some poetic license but what you really want is someone to read it and, and believe that that's real yes. yeah yeah uh, for me police procedurals only for me this is work when you buy into the world and you think oh okay uh, that feels pretty real in terms of an incident room or a, a, or a briefing or um, a forensic lab that kind of stuff feels real and I've for me I, I once that's broken when you sort of have people doing jobs that you don't believe they would do or 
stretching the beyond, you know, people running around with guns in. I, 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 there's part of me that just goes, I don't, that's not for me. And I don't want to write like that. So yeah, 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 definitely. Now you, early on in the book, Ruth, you make a very interesting um, comment about changes in policing with regard to attitudes towards female officers. Mm. Uh, because she's, she's they're, they're gathered together and, and there are a room full of officers. I think she says there's only four, four female officers um, mm. and, and yet, you know, things have changed. Yeah. Um, and, and again, I, I wondered why you wanted to bring, you know, bring an issue like that into the writing. I think it's still prevalent. And I think uh, the, my friend who was a sergeant, she joined the police pretty much the same time as Ruth did in 1992. Mm. And some of the stories she told me uh, when they first were there wearing skirts and handbags and, and, I mean, and the, the comments from the older male officers mm -hmm. were horrendous. Mm -hmm. um, and although we're now, you know, 20, 30 years later, you know, you don't have to, you don't have to go very far to open a newspaper and see, see that there is still an issue um, yeah, yeah. with the UK police force. It's, it, it's interesting, isn't it, that it's almost like X number of steps forward. Yeah. And then, and then those steps back. Um, and, you know, I, I, I love, the, you know, the way that the book started me to think, you know, because in conjunction with things that have happened recently and, and, and that come out in the press and wondering, you know, are we really going to see significant change so that aspects like that don't need to be written about? Or yeah. if they are, it's like, it's coming from the point of view of, oh, what massive changes have occurred because blah, blah, blah. Oh, yeah. yeah, and also she's a, she's a gay character because she's a gay character, and for me, I mean, people have asked me, you know, you're a white heterosexual man. Why why did you choose mm. that? Um, and I had a, I had a very close friend when I was teaching who um, she had been married and had a teenage daughter, and and um, and then she had a gay relationship. She's now married to her wife, and I and you know, I spoke to her quite a lot about it over the years as a teacher, and I just sort of wanted it. I sort of I just felt, I don't know why, but anyway, when I developed Ruth, that happened and I found it quite interesting to write it in a way that's so incredibly matter of fact. Um, uh, and that's, she just, she's an incredibly good detective. She's a great mum and she happens to be gay and actually she doesn't make, you know, so what? And I kind of quite liked, I sort of liked that. Um, um and mm -hmm. yeah I, I agree with you I think you know it doesn't have to be something spectacular no uh but the idea of just telling someone's story as it is yep you know it, it they don't need to be you know whispered whatever's or whatever. it, it you know it is this is who I am yep yeah so and, yeah and it, I enjoyed and, and that I, the, throughout that series it's not been made an issue of because it, I kind of go We'd be, we're, we're past that, surely, in 2022, hopefully. Well, hopefully, or at least when people, you know, the idea, again, you know, writing those stories and writing those lives, that we present it like that. Yeah. Because, because yeah. you know, that is, yeah, definitely. Now, if we can, so, so that we have Ruth and her partner, Nick Evans, and, um, mm -hmm. Uh, and and I, again, I, I love his family background. Uh, you know, uh, with his little girl and his wife Amanda, and and the change, the, you know, the surprise that is within the book of, of yes. what changes their family setting. But what I noticed um, that he is a recovering alcoholic. Yeah. Uh, and I just wondered whether the way that you write him is. Do you do you believe that because there's the adage, isn't there, that um, a leopard can never change its spots, mm -hmm. and yet you get a sense with with Nick that yes, people can change, but you know we people don't have to stay the same. There's there's a possibility of making those changes, and I just wondered if you know you you've written a character that way. Do you, do you, do you think that? Do you think along those lines? I'm in recovery, so that's why Nick's a recovering alcoholic. So. <laughs> 
yeah, uh, yeah. Certainly, in the, I mean, it's pretty visceral because in the opening book, he's still in the midst of being a functioning alcoholic. I mean, he's still <sighs> falling down the stairs and drinking vodka at three o'clock in the morning. So, uh, and I've used the books in some ways, again, in sort of personal, Mm -hmm. a, a sort of journey of kind of finding going to AA and finding recovery and he meets Amanda in AA and um and again gets his life back he gets his life back and you know he's on the verge of sort of utter self-destruction uh and I suppose I've got to play out um my journey and my thoughts on that um in terms of sort of I think an alcoholic's always an alcoholic. Mm -hmm, I think mm -hmm. if you're an addict, you're an addict. Um, but um, with the right support, I think, uh, for, I, I can only speak for myself, with the right support, um, you can change your life completely around. Um, mm. And uh, yeah, it's no longer an issue, so. Mm, mm. And, and there's, there's a, again, not wanting to give away what happens, but when, when, when Amanda reveals something to Nick, and she's worried about how he'll react. Mm. And, and I just love the way he said, well, I wish you told me, but who am I mm. to be mad about anything, you know, given, you know. Yeah, my past. My past, you know, the train wreck of a past that I have. I can't, I can't be angry. I can't judge people. And I just thought they were beautiful words to read mm. and how he reacts and, and, and you know, how he supports her in, in this situation. It was just, you know, given, you know, given the crimes that then are happening, you know, I'm, I'm sure it's okay to talk about because it's at the beginning of the book, you know, the finding of a severed foot yes. um, <laughs> in the lake. <laughs> um, you know, I, you gave such beautiful, gentle moments as well in the story. Yeah, good. Oh, Which, I wonder how that came across. Yeah, just, just, just beautiful. Uh, and again, I could see, you know, I, I could see this, I could even envisage this on the screen, uh, of, you know, of characters and how they would behave with each other, which I, mm. I found very encouraging. But I suppose we must to the crime or the crimes. Mm. It is vital because really, truthfully, that's what we like. We do like the grimness. Um, and again, without giving too much away, I wonder if you could tell us, you know, what is behind um, the grimness that lurks within these pages? For me, yes, yes, and again, just you know, maybe hint at what we know some of the crime that you know, what, what is the criminal element? To I think, as a writer, for me, it's always, um, in terms of anything I read or anything I write about crime, it's the why. I'm always mm. fascinated by the why, um, not necessarily the what or the who, but the why and what the sort of deep, dark psychology that drives somebody to murder uh, or commit a, a terrible crime. And I wonder whether, sort of holding up a mirror, you wonder whether in, in extraordinary circumstances, are we all capable of this? I don't know. Um, yeah. And, but it's sort of like kind of examining the darkness of, of human nature. And I find that absolutely fascinating of what drives people in and sometimes those that you know their motives are warped and um, selfish, um, and other times it's a moment of utter madness. But I kind of, for me as a writer, those that moment at which something happens is is incredibly powerful and interesting to to find out the psychology behind it, mm. um, and that's why I write about it. Mm. And as well, as they research into. Uh, <laughs> The person who this foot may or may be not belong to. Yes. Um, into the story comes the aspect of the Liverpool gangland. Yeah. Um, and so it made me start to think of the connections between North Wales and the North West, mm. particularly that aspect, Merseyside, Liverpool, Wrexham around there. And and you know, to what extent does Liverpool gangland activity spill over into North Wales? And whether you yourself, um, because by the sound of it, you you know you do you know the research that you do, like into the procedural and things like that. And I was wondering, 
you know, did you did you go undercover to find out about yeah, these that's a really good, it's a very perceptive question because uh, there's a huge ongoing theme about this th through the whole series about county lines, mm. the influence of the gangs of Liverpool stretching out their tentacles into North Wales. Mm -hmm. um, and as a bit of a kind of handbrake turn, the um, when we touch on it, The Dark Tide, my new book, is all about that, but it's set on Anglesey. But there are mm. huge links to, to county lines, drug running. Um, yeah, I spoke to, um, when I was talking about my detective sergeant friend in Wrexham, mm -hmm. he's, you know, he said that they would go into houses in Wrexham and there would be five Liverpudlian lads there who'd been sent down from Liverpool to do county lines drug dealing in North Wales. Um, so it's a massive problem and I did a lot of research on it. Um, so yes, I think that it's, there's, a, it, it's, um, there's a kind of a natural link between the, the, the areas. Mm, yeah, because it, it made me think it's it's Liverpool and it's not Manchester, mm. or it's Liverpool and it's not Birmingham. Yeah, it, you know, I mean, yeah, I know, you know, proximity-wise, Liverpool, of course, and it's almost like and it's just round the corner. And the Wirral kind of almost sort of overlaps. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, right. yeah. So, so the blurring as well of those. Um, national you know if we think england and wales and the blurring of those national yeah. boundaries and because then it made me you know again in the book you you know you include um reference to the lake itself and how the waters of that lake Ooh. go back into yes. england um so, yeah so then so that 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 ebb and flow yeah. Absolutely, yeah. Um, of well, I was going to you know talk about substances and, and things like that, but how on the one hand, it's that life giving element that flows one way, and then the other way is this this element that works very much, yeah. you know, the opposite, and then and and so then it started me to think about you know almost like politically and then I thought no don't go there it's just a crime book stop reading too much into this no I'm fascinated by all this but it started me thinking about the idea of the influence one way and the other you know and and with regard to Welsh identity and the 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 beautiful life-giving positive aspects of Welsh culture you know the, the Welsh, and then and then ecologically, um, mm -hmm. and then all the evil influences and demands of what happens or comes from across the border. And please don't get me wrong. You know, I mean, I'm, I'm English. My parents live in Wales, but just that dynamic, yeah, well, of of British politics. Yeah. Well, interestingly enough, I have. Um, if if anyone wanted to, or if you wanted to. Uh, join my, um, I have a, an email, a VIP club, uh -huh. and with those I give away two prequel no novellas. The first one is about Ruth Hunter on her literally first month as a uniformed officer in 1993 in London, the South London, and how she tries to make the move to becoming a detective. And, and the second one, which is which is why this I think this is relevant, is about the the psychic Nick, and how he grows up and he has a a, a kind of nemesis about this guy called um, Curtis Blake, uh -huh. who comes from Liverpool, and their lives are kind of inextricably linked as they grow up, and he becomes a massive drug dealer in in Liverpool, and Nick becomes a policeman, and that nemesis actually then explodes in book two and explodes in book four. It's a kind of ongoing situation. But at the beginning of that novella, I actually looked at the kind of the links going way back so that there were Welsh, uh, Welsh labourers and Welsh craftsmen who came from North Wales to build Liverpool in the 1800s. And there are pockets of Liverpool where there are Welsh street names. 
because that's where they settled. Um, so that kind of there's a there's a you know that link again of them sort of right okay we're going to go and help build this great English city. Um, so I love all that stuff, all those links. But what has absolutely caught me there in what you said is because the Welsh link and Liverpool, I think, is you know eclipsed often by the island yeah, Liverpool yeah, yeah. Uh, connection. Um, ooh, thank you. You've you've given me much food for thought on the yeah. historical. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I'd have to send it over you to read. Mm, very, very much so. And again, you know, en encourage uh, encourage our viewers as well. Um, sign up uh, uh, for Simon's email there because I think I think if you are somebody who enjoys going further and deeper into a story or a set of mm. characters, um, I think there's 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 riches to be had there. Absolutely, yeah. A couple of other questions which may sound a little bit flippant after what we've been talking about but but what I, I love when an author's writing just set sparks going uh, in so uh, in that opening part of the book where the severed foot is found mm. there are two two sisters two young women uh, out paddle boarding on the lake mm -hmm. and I wondered if you paddle boarded yourself I don't I I instead I go swimming mm -hmm. in cold water <laughs> so, I think they called it wild swimming wild swimming yeah now, and wild did, swimming. Did, so, did, did Wales did Wales incite you to that did, were you yes. not a wild swimmer before you moved no 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 it's only recently it's only the last year or two uh -huh. so um, when we go to the coast uh I although I cheat because I put on a wetsuit which apparently is not the thing but I have been in the sea in December uh, and I was in the sea about a month ago um, and there's a couple of lakes near here which I will a couple of friends and we'll go and put wetsuits on and dive in so uh, and I've seen paddle boarders so I guess that in my head um, I don't know why paddle boarding anyway it came to me that there were two yeah. young girls sort of paddle boarding around and then a big foot bangs against the paddleboard and it's that, that sets us off it's quite nice and gruesome it it is it really is because up until that point it's quite an idyllic setting yes. um <laughs> you know the, 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 you know these two sisters uh and you know as they've grown older they've grown closer and yeah. they you know they're great together and and that family moment is just like yep. yeah yeah very dramatic <laughs> works really really well so while swimming uh, and in that area in North Wales, but I wanted to ask you, um, either a body of water or, or a place in Snowdonia, do you have a favourite spot that if, for example, I were to come and visit, that you would take me to because for you it still takes your breath away? Clambedrog Beach is just the most beautiful beach in the world. I've been, I've been kind of lucky enough to be around the world and yet it's sort of just stunning great a, a huge great big beach and then as you when you're on the far side as you look back across down to this huge great big sandy beach in the background you can see the, the, the ridges of Snowdonia Park so when you, you can actually get a sunset where the sun is setting behind Snowdonia and then you've got these mountains and then you've got these beautiful trees and then the it comes over the beach and i just go it just it's mm. incredible mm. um so yeah it's a beautiful it's a beautiful place uh and the sea is always very calm so i can always jump in with my son and uh yeah if we if i can find somewhere to buy around there i would move there in a heartbeat but, yeah uh, yeah beautiful beautiful thank thank you for that thank you for sharing that now um Again, I, I always love these tasters or these teasers um, because I did read uh, the notion of a forthcoming TV series. I have to say I was quite bereft to learn once it started this weekend that this is the last series of, of Hidden Place. Mm. Um, I, I do think Welsh crime drama is, is something rather special. Mm. Um, and then I read, uh, in preparation for our time together, that there's a possibility of a forthcoming TV series. Are we allowed to speak about that? 
a little bit. It's been optioned. So uh -huh. the, the TV and film rights have been optioned and a deal has been done. Um, there is a very well-known actress who I can't reveal on pain No, no, you must I, I loved it. I, I just love the thought, though, because it leaves us with that thing of what mm. might this be? And, you know, and yeah, so thank you for giving us something to look forward to. Anything else that you can say about? No, I mean... I've just been I've just been watching I don't know if you ever saw Top of the Lake. Uh, yes. Oh yes. I've been watching that and going god this would be this is how I envisage the Snowdonia killings as a as a TV series the Top yeah. of the Lake is the perfect kind of companion piece. So um I assume the scripts will be written this year and I'm assuming they'll film next year if things go ahead. Mm -hmm. Will, yeah. will you will you be will you be permitted to uh, contribute or or will you will you stay away from things? I've, I've been given the grand title of I've been allowed to be an executive producer on it, so okay. a consultant. So yeah. I think um, the people making it want me to be very involved with the creative process. Um, they've even said you know maybe after the episodes one and two I could start maybe write a script for it or if if I have time but um yeah I was going to say given given the the you know the the, the speed with which new novels yeah, appear I think I to do it, but. <laughs> yeah yeah but but that said you know it it's not as if you are not a seasoned script writer is it no, so no, I have done it before so yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah they, they might you know they might well benefit you know from from your experience that would be my thinking yeah yeah so so hopefully fingers crossed but having worked in tv development i know how long these things take indeed how, indeed how difficult it is to get away and yeah. so we'll see um but it would be a lovely be lovely if it happens so yeah it's, it's it certainly would because again i think a you know your stories you know just have something so special about them but again that location and how it lends itself mm. to, to that visual Absolutely. yeah yeah that visual backdrop um so book 11 the lake Verunui killings but then you've talked to me about dark tide mm. uh, and a new character that you've developed, DCI Laura Hart, I believe yes. she's called. Okay. Yeah. So, but then you talked about, so it's not the end of the DI Ruth Hunter because you talked about book 12. Yeah. So tell, talk to me about your process of creating a new series whilst at the same time still carrying on something that is very well established now. Well, Harper Collins, who um, quite big in terms of the publishing world, <laughs> rocked up to my agent and said, can Simon write us a series? Um, and I sort of went, oh, that sounds good, because um, the one thing I, I struggle with um, as, a, as an independent publisher is getting my books into major public. Uh, Indeed, books. yeah, yeah. Um, so, you know, you can, you know they, are in, they are in Waterstones and Wrexham, but they're probably not in Waterstones in the middle of London. Um, so obviously working with HarperCollins, they will be everywhere. Yes. So I assume that that seems like, and it'd be nice, you know, it's, a, it's a very different process, but it's a nice process, or it has been in touch with so far. Um, so I've sort of, and Anglesey's beautiful, I've been to Anglesey many times, and it's stunning, it's a great place. Uh, and it's very different to Snowdonia, but it has, you know, equally is sort of many folks, folk tales and myths, yes. and it's, it's beautiful, the Menno Strait and stuff. So. Um, I just thought, well, that's a great place to set another crime drama. And so I've sort of created this character. She, uh, so Laura was the chief negotiator, hostage negotiator for the Manchester police. Something terribly went, went terribly wrong three years before the book starts. Uh, she lost her husband, who was a police officer, and she has relocated with her two children back to Anglesey, her home. Oh set things up um, and something happens at the beginning of the book where the local police want her to come and help hostage negotiate she doesn't want to do it because of what went wrong three years earlier but um, 
she finds out that her 11 year old son is caught up in the middle of it so then she has the dilemma that she needs to go and do this to save him so that's the pitch for the first book um mm. and i'm now and i'm busily i'm just about to finish book two of that so of that series so i love how the what you've done with this is you've turned you flipped this and this is someone going back home yes you know and um, all that that brings with yeah. it um there's a lot that's very very comfortable but there's a lot that can be very very uncomfortable when you've been away for so long and 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 you know learning to be part of something again so that's going to be yeah um, yeah and it's not you know it's not a million miles away from the d high ruth hunter series because wait, um, wait, can, can i ask can i ask would you are, are you going to do crossover at all i don't know there's there are a couple of points where laura has been to north wales and i suddenly thought oh my god they could actually just bump into each other um, but I haven't got, I haven't, <laughs> I haven't done it yet, but it has crossed my mind. Is it, I wonder, mm, interesting. Maybe further down the line, I think that would be really fun. Mm, yeah, yeah. I, I, just the thought of, of you know, the, the possibility the of, room. yeah, yeah. And, and what that, and, and how they might meet and what that might, might lead to, or, you know, or if it's just a passing thing that, you know, making comment about oh. some case or something like that. Yeah, yep. the possibilities. Oh, yeah. Simon, 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 I'm I'm aware of the time, uh, and I, I'm aware how busy you are in, in creating all that you create. So I have I have one last extremely frivolous question Thank for you. you. Um, and there's a comment uh, between Ruth and Nick at, at the beginning of the story um, about Bonnie Tyler being the queen of wealth pop <laughs> totally clips of the heart which again set me singing away um I, I, and i wondered are you are you a fan of bonnie tyler um i, I like that song i'm not a massive fan of bonnie <laughs> tyler um but uh i like i like the fact that they disagree about music so mm, mm. Um, and, and the age i i liked the age difference dynamic as well i think yeah that... he loves his kind of modern guitar bands and she's always banging on about going to a wham concert or duran duran and i just love i love all that stuff because i just think it kind of gives it a real kind of texture so yeah um, yeah but the but, but i think you know again the the dynamic between them it's really encouraging um you know so often we see things whereby you know the tension you know it's a little bit uncomfortable yeah. but I, it's really yeah. nice because that can't happen so therefore it, they are just really really very very close friends yeah. there's no sexual tension uh, and in some ways that kind of makes it really special in some ways yeah 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 completely open and honest with each other yeah yeah very much so so like i say please viewers if you have never ventured into the snowdonia killings please do uh, i may be gone for some time um because i've got another 10 books to get through uh so if i am not seen here on the channel for a while you can blame simon mcleave uh, for that no what, what an absolutely delicious way uh to be locked away uh from crime fiction um all the very best uh very you well. know with this i mean it's already a hugely popular series but also the new venture with yeah. dci laura hart and and also it being in a different you know a different way of your work going out to yeah. the public i if it's all right with you i would love for us to you know come back uh, in a certain amount of time and me ask you about Absolutely, the, yeah, the difference in that experience mm. of you know of doing of, of doing things your own way or doing things you know being showed up by you know a, a mainstream publisher sure no it'd be interesting i'd love to do yeah that. yeah simon mcleaf thank you so much for our time together thank you let's speak soon all right okay bye-bye for now bye-bye